I'm with you guys today talking about seventh generation. Um, is, is everybody familiar with seventh generation or are people not familiar? No. Okay. So seventh generation is a brand of household cleaning products, paper products, personal care products. So we make toilet paper and paper towels. We make laundry detergent and dishwasher cleaner. We make disinfectant, we make wipes, we make baby diapers, we make feminine care products. Uh, probably about a hundred different products in all. And I started the company before, I think most of you were born in 1988. And we sold the company to Unilever in, in 2016, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, wanted to start out with two of my favorite quotes. Joseph Jaworski wrote, the physical survival of the human race depends on a radical change in the human heart. And Gandhi wrote, we must be the change we seek in the world. Those are two of my favorite quotes. Uh, I don't know how many of you grew up in New York City, but I grew up in New York uh, in the 60s. My dad ran an ad advertising agency called Gray International. And I went to a fancy prep school that most of you know called Riverdale. Um, and I, I grew up, uh, and sort of was a teenager during the Vietnam War. And that war really shaped my political and social sensibilities. I was a lousy student. I went to four different high schools, uh, including Riverdale. Uh, and I spent a year going to Santa Barbara High School in California and living in my car for about three months of the school year uh, which is sort of amazing, uh, but there's lots of public amenities out in California. It doesn't get as cold as New York, and I was able to survive there for, for three months before I saved up enough money working after school to rent an apartment. I did go to college. I didn't last very long. I went to college for a year and a half at a college that is struggling for its survival, Hampshire College, up in uh, Massachusetts. And one of the things that is really important to me in my life, and I, and I think it's something that, that you should all think about, is that even though I was a lousy student, I had a great number of mentors and teachers, many of which I discovered and had relationships with outside of school. And finding great mentors to complement, and those mentors can be your teachers in school, but they can also be people out of school. Those mentors were critical to me in my life and my education. But before we talk about seventh generation, I wanna talk about economics just for a moment. Uh, and so unmute yourselves, if you would, just for a second. And does anyone want to answer this question? Is there such a thing as a free market? <laughs> Speak up, I can't really hear you. Um, I'd say it's like laws of fair where like the government doesn't interfere with anything. That's what a but, free market is when government doesn't interfere? Like they don't control like production centers. They just let, or they don't control prices. But usually governments don't do that, I think. Like tariffs, they do tariffs, but tariffs would be like against the free market. Okay. Who else has a thought about, is there such a thing as a free market, particularly in the United States? Um, I would say no. I don't think there anywhere there exists a fully free market. I think capitalism kind of wants a free market, but I don't think any country or any nation in the world has something called a free market. 
Okay. Anybody want to disagree with her? Well, you get the last word, and I think you're right. I agree with you completely. Uh, the way that our government interferes in the marketplace, it does things that eliminate the concept of a free market. Now, you might have teachers that talk to you about a free market, but when you spend billions of dollars subsidizing certain industries like the oil and gas industry, and when you give tax breaks to other companies, it really isn't a free market. The government does have a huge impact on that market, and that impact has a huge effect on prices. Next question, who writes the rules that govern how business operates? Anybody have an idea? Who writes the rules that govern how business operates? Any idea? Anybody have an idea who writes those rules? Well, the truth is that business writes the rules that govern itself. Through hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of lobbying efforts, particularly over the last 30 to 40 years, business has had a huge impact on regulations and legislation. And just for example, the US Chamber of Commerce has a lobbying budget of $200 million a year that just is spent to influence legislation. Two more things that I just wanna to touch on. We have a real challenge in this country around our failure to enforce antitrust legislation. Do people know what antitrust legislation is? Yeah, so antitrust legislation prevents <clears throat> businesses from becoming monopolies. But we have companies like Amazon and Facebook that virtually function as monopolies. And monopolies are a problem because they stifle competition and raise prices for consumers. And in fact, in the United States, three to four companies on average control 70 or more percent of the market. And the last thing I want to talk about is an idea that hopefully will become something that you become familiar with, and that's called full cost accounting. What we have today is a system where businesses pay for some things, but they don't pay for other things. The other things are negative impacts they have on people and the planet. So for example, if you're making a minimum wage, you're actually going to live in poverty and it requires the government to subsidize you with things like food stamps for you to survive. Why would we be allowed to pay such a small salary to people that they can't survive without government support? Another externality is when a car company sells a car, that car pollutes the air as we do as drivers. Who cleans up the mess from that pollution? Society does. But we should make the car companies and the individual drivers responsible because the car companies and the individual drivers emit pollution that causes climate change, that causes asthma and allergy, and all kinds of other hazardous health impacts. If you're going to make a mess that has a negative health effect, or a negative environmental effect, I think that you as a company should be responsible for cleaning up that mess. So just because you're an economics club, I thought I would start out with just a few thoughts about economics. But now let me turn to tell you a little bit about Seventh Generation. First, the name. The name comes from the Iroquois, the Native American tribe, and it comes out of their Bible from a quote that says, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations, which is a tall order. It's an order that requires us to think 
from a systemic perspective, to think from a very long-term perspective, and to take incredible responsibility for all of our actions. The company which is known for being a responsible, sustainable business was also quite a great financial success. In 2000, our share price was $1.75. 16 years later, when Unilever purchased the company, they purchased for $53.95 a share, which is a return, if my math is correct, which it not always is, of 3,000%. So this company did very well financially. So the company, as I said, was started in 1988, and it was started as a mission-driven business. Does anyone have a sense of what a mission-driven business is? What does that mean? Anybody have an idea? Can anyone think of another mission-driven business? SpaceX. SpaceX, okay, what's their mission? Um, to go to Mars to discover space, maybe. Okay, okay. Absolutely. Uh, any other, anyone else, can you think of a mission-driven business? What about Ben & Jerry's? Is Ben & Jerry's a mission-driven business? Oh, like, I guess they have, like, they haven't been outspoken against the, like, migrant crisis. Right. Uh-huh. So they have a mission that's not just selling ice cream, right? They have a much broader mission than just selling ice cream. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I'd say a good thing because it motivates you. Motivates your employees and motivates your consumers. So seventh generation has a mission as well. <clears throat> and one of the ways to describe that mission is to inspire a more conscious and sustainable world by being an authentic force for positive change. Our mission was not to sell toilet paper or laundry detergent. We sold toilet paper and laundry detergent so that we could be a conscious, sustainable company and be an influence for positive change. And Seventh Generation is a green company rather than a company with a green product. So that means that everything we do is about being environmentally responsible. And that goes way beyond just the products we sell, but it goes to all of the ways in which the company behaves. And if anyone has a question, don't hesitate to ask because I'm here in part to answer any questions you might have. So this is how we started. We started by selling bathroom tissue or toilet paper. Uh, this was back in 1991. And we sold brown, unbleached, scratchy bathroom tissue that the manufacturer thought no one would buy because it was brown and because it wasn't very soft, but that was the basis of our business. And it was the biggest product that we ever had and ever sold. So let me just tell you about the first 12 years we were in business. Most of the products we sold focused on energy and water conservation. In 1990, our third year of business, our sales grew 700% from a million to seven million. And despite the fact that we lost money, we still gave away 1% of our sales to nonprofit organizations like Greenpeace and Sierra Club and the Audubon Society. Every employee we had was a shareholder and an owner of the company. And we wanted people to not think like employees, but to act like owners and to treat the company as they would if they were owners. 
Our culture was a reflection of our values. In 1993, we actually went public, even though we didn't become profitable till two years later into 1995. And then in 1999, we gave up being public and went private. People know the difference between a public and a private company. Everyone can invest in a public company. So Unilever, the company that bought Seventh Generation is a public company. Procter & Gamble is a public company. If you can't buy shares in the company on the stock exchange, that's because it's a private company and you have to go through a special process to acquire shares in that company. We were very focused on educating our consumers. This was a roll of bathroom tissue we printed about the dangers of chlorine. It says, if you can't read it, learn the facts about chlorine that will scare the crap out of you. And that, is a roll of toilet paper that was printed with all the facts about why chlorine is dangerous. And chlorine, even though you might see people use it for cleaning or you might see people use it in the swimming pool, is a very, very dangerous chemical that we never used in our products. One of the things that we were very committed to is this idea of transparency. Do you guys, anyone have a sense of what transparency means or corporate transparency? So that means revealing things that might normally be secret. So we would reveal all of the formulas for all of our products because we wanted our customers to know what was in the products that we sold. Uh, we were transparent uh, in uh, our marketing and our claims. And we also did something that many companies don't do, which is we lobbied the government to require more disclosure of more information for more companies. Most companies don't want to have to provide a lot of information to the public or the government. We thought that people have a right to know about the companies they're buying from and what's in the products they're selling. So we talked a little bit about our sales. The company's sales grew from 3.2 million in 1995 to almost 50 million in 2005, which is 31% a year. And from 2005 to 2010, the company's sales grew from 50 to 150 million. And today the company sales are probably over 500 million. So the company has grown quite nicely. And what's really important, some people think that companies that have these types of values are not as successful as what we call, might call traditional companies. And I would argue that actually these values focused, responsible, sustainable businesses often perform much better than traditional companies. So I wanna dive a little bit more deeply into the purpose of our business. And the purpose of our business is described in what we call our global imperatives. And our global imperatives are derived by asking a question, what does the world most need that we are uniquely qualified to provide? We're not asking how we make the most money, how we sell the most products. We're asking how we can be of great service to the world. And our first global imperative is, as a business, we are committed to being educators and to encourage those we educate to create with us a world of equity, justice, health, and well-being. So that's an unusual goal for a business. Most businesses you would come across, as I said before, are focused on how to sell the most stuff, 
how to make the most money for their shareholders. And I would argue that that's not the way to build the most successful company. We had, when we, we think about education, we had an educational program in partnership with Greenpeace and we taught our customers how to be environmental activists. And some of them would go down to Washington every year and actually go through a training camp with Greenpeace and then demonstrate out in front of the Capitol. Uh, again, not something that most companies are doing. Our second global imperative is we, to achieve that, we must create a world of conscious workers, citizens, and consumers. And to be conscious means to be more aware of yourself and your impact on the world and other people. And that is often something that, that, that people are not very focused on. We are committed to creating a world that is rich in value as contrasted to a world that is rich in artifacts. We will work to create governance and social systems that increase the capacity for understanding different points, different perspectives and points of view. We believe that our business and all businesses must engage in the personal development of everyone who works for them. We are committed to approaching everything we do from a systems perspective. Have any of you had a class on systems thinking? Anybody? No? So systems thinking is something that focuses you on the unintended consequences of your action and the interrelationship of different things. So nature works as a system. Trees are naturally designed to take in sunlight with their leaves that causes them to grow. And trees actually have a very elaborate system that they, that they have designed to ensure their thriving and surviving. And the last one is we are cre committed to creating a business which is not just sustainable, but restorative. And the difference between sustainability and restorative is really, really important. Sustainability is often too focused on sustaining things the way they are. And when we have the kind of air pollution we have and we have the challenges we're facing with climate change, we don't want to just sustain the world. We want to restore it back to its original health. And it's really important that businesses and products think about being restorative, not just being sustainable. And that means being less bad and actually thinking about what it means to be good. Can anybody think about a product they consider good? Have you bought something that you feel proud of that you would consider a good product? Anybody? A metal water bottle. A what? A metal water bottle. And why, why does that strike you as a good product? Um, because we don't have to, um, you can just fill it up and you don't have to uh, waste plastic. Right. So it's reusable instead of disposable. So that's really, really important. That's a really important choice. Can anyone else think of a good product? I have natural hair, so I really like the Myel Organics products line. Great. So is that certified organic by the FDA? I'm not sure if it's certified organic, but I really appreciate the company because of what they stand for and who the founder is. And so I feel like their products, um, I really trust the intent behind their products and the message that they're bringing across. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So I hope all of you think about what you buy because you can have a huge 
impact on the world and other people by those choices. And over your lifetime, the average person will spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars buying stuff. And how you decide to choose those products is really, really important because with each one of your purpose, with each one of your purchases, you're sort of casting a vote for the companies and the products you're choosing. And it's really important to be conscious about those choices and to support companies that are doing the right thing. How would you know if a company was doing the right thing? What would, what, what, what would you look for if you were trying to find a company that was doing the right thing? Anybody have any ideas other than organic? Um, sometimes uh, companies have labels that uh, is like a proof that um, the company like is being environmental. So certifications. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other ideas? Perhaps vegan or cruelty free in addition to what was just said. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Any okay. other ideas? Outside of doing the right thing environmentally, I like to look at the leadership within companies to see what their core values are and make sure that what the product is pushing is in line with what the leadership actually believes. Uh-huh. And how would you find out what the leadership believes? Oftentimes I look into, if it's a product that I'm really into, I'll look into what the CEO's personal life looks like, any TED Talks that they've done, what other media they have out that shares how they became into the position that they are or what um, their background is. Great. All terrific things to do. One of the most, the, one of the easiest ways to uh, find the best companies and the best products is if they're certified as a B corporation. Has anyone ever heard of a B corporation? So there's 2,000 companies like Seventh Generation that are certified as B companies. And it's a very, very rigorous process that they go through in terms of evaluating both how they operate the company, how the management functions and the products that they sell. And Ben and Jerry's is a B corporation. Patagonia is a B corporation. Seventh Generation is a B corporation. Many of the, the companies that you might be familiar with should have a logo on their product that tells you that they're certified as a B corporation. And it's, from my perspective, the best way to identify responsible companies and responsible brands. So I was at Seventh Generation for about 20 years as the CEO, and now I am still a board member. But there were three things that I, that I learned during those 20 years. One is that these responsible, sustainable, organic products often cause often cost significantly more money and they're not accessible to lower income people. And that's a real challenge because in many respects, healthier, safer products are needed by everyone and those products shouldn't cost more money. And one of the reasons those products cost more money is because they're not externalizing their negative impacts on the environment, but they're internalizing them. So when you, for example, buy organic strawberries and you're buying strawberries that are treating the farm workers well, you're buying strawberries that don't use pesticides, that don't pollute the groundwater, don't get sprayed in the air to put health risks for people living around the strawberry farm, that costs more money. A traditional strawberry would externalize those costs on society. So if you're using pesticides that pollute the groundwater, the strawberry farm doesn't take any responsibility for that polluted water. 
they don't take any responsibility for the way in which those pesticides damage the health of the workers who are working on the farm. So it is really, really important over time that we work towards this concept that we talked about earlier called full cost accounting so that we can internalize those costs. And what would be amazing if we had full cost accounting is that organic food would actually cost less than non-organic food. And all organic products, because they internalize those externalities, would cost less than traditional products. Second thing I came away thinking about is that while companies like Seventh Generation and Ben and & Jerry's and Patagonia are great exceptions to the rules and do wonderful things, in order to make real change in our society, we have to actually change the rules by which all businesses operate. So 10 years ago when I left Seventh Generation, I started an organization called the American Sustainable Business Council. And they work in Washington to do good things for the planet and for society. Good things like putting a price on carbon. So companies that cause CO2 pollution would have to pay for that pollution and they would be less inclined to do it. So the people that were putting pesticides on their crops and polluted the groundwater would have to pay to clean up that groundwater. We work to increase the minimum wage that people are getting paid. People can't live on seven, eight dollars an hour. Uh, in most cases, they need at least fifteen dollars an hour to pay for them their their rent and their food and their families. And it's not good for business, not good for our society to have such low wages. In fact, I don't know, has anyone ever worked in a restaurant? Well, restaurant workers can get paid as little as $2.13 an hour because they also get tips. But if you don't get good tips, how could anyone survive making $2.13 an hour? And the last thing I learned, which we were just talking about, is don't be less bad, try to be good. And the framework that I have used to think about all this is, is comprised of, of five different things. Instead of trying to save the world, create models and new institutions that support a just, equitable, and sustainable future. Instead of trying to fix a problem, address the system that underlies that problem. Instead of just being an exception to the rules, as ASBC does, try to change the rules. Instead of doing less bad, do good. Instead of focusing on sustainability, focus on restoration and resilience. So, I want to talk lastly about the future of responsible business and where it needs to go. So, when you think about the environmental impact of products in companies, has anyone ever read uh, a sustainability report from a company? But most companies publish, just like they publish an annual financial report, they publish an annual sustainability report. And that talks about the water they use to make their product, the energy that was used to transport that product, around the country, the waste from the packaging and the disposal of that product. It captures lots of the environmental and social impacts of the products that companies sell, except for the use of the product by the consumer. And so when you think about shampoo or you think about 
laundry detergent, what do you think the biggest environmental impact of those types of products are? Anybody have an idea? The use of water. The use of water is certainly a big impact. Any other impacts? So the biggest impact of these products, which is bigger than the actual use of water, is heating the water up. So when you heat the water up in the laundry or in the shower, that's 90% of the total environmental impact of that product. Only 10% of the impact comes from the packaging, the ingredients, the transportation. 90% of the impact comes from the consumer's use of the product when that water is heated up. So what can you do as a consumer to mitigate that impact? How can you lessen your negative impact if heating water up is the biggest impact on the environment and on climate change? What could you do to change that? What about taking a shorter shower? What about doing your laundry in cold water instead of hot water? Those are specific ways in which you can significantly lessen your environmental impact and the product's environmental impact. Short showers and using, I don't think most of you would be too happy taking a cold shower, but that would be the best thing you could do. Um, but certainly taking a shorter shower. Does anyone have any idea what the average length of a shower is? What do you think? Six minutes or five minutes. Twice as much. 13 minutes is the average length of the average shower. So if you're taking a six minute shower, you're doing a great job and you've cut your impact on the environment in half. Um, let's see. So we talked about full cost accounting. Um, has anyone ever heard of this idea called the sharing economy? So the sharing economy is like, ever heard of Zipcar? where many people share the use of a single car. It's almost like car rentals. Instead of buying your own car, you share a car with other people. You can do the same thing with tools. You can do the same thing with a chainsaw. You can do the same thing with a vacation house. If we share these products and services with other people, we don't have the same adverse effect on the environment and our society as we do if we all purchase our own. So let me ask you guys another question. When you think about the challenges that are facing our world and our environment, what do you think the biggest challenge is? Someone give me an idea. Uh, hi. Maybe it's like getting people to listen to your ideas or to like talk about changing certain things. So that's, that's true. That's a big problem. As much as I talk and as much as I give people ideas, it's hard to convince them to change. What else? What else? What, what, are, what are you guys most worried about? Other than will you get into college and will there be a job and can you afford to go to college? I don't know. What are you guys most worried about? A couple of people have put their comments in the chat also. Oh, sorry. Can you see that and read them to me? Uh, um, so earlier to your question, someone said human greed, changing people's lifestyles, opinions, being lazy, climate change, 
corporate regulations. Okay. Great. So those are the things that you guys are worried about. I, I have two things that I worry the most about. One is climate change, which is already here. And many people say that it is the next pandemic that we're going to face. 50% uh, of the country of Bangladesh in the next 20, 30 years will be underwater. Uh, a terrible, terrible situation. We already are having much more violent hurricanes and storms and tornadoes that are costing billions and billions of dollars. And unfortunately, the biggest adverse effects of climate change will be on the people who are the poorest, who live in the most vulnerable locations, who live next to manufacturing plants that are creating lots of pollution, who live by the shore. So climate change is right at the top of my list and something that all of you should really be paying attention to. All of you should be thinking about things you can do to mitigate your impact on climate change, like using a reusable water bottle, taking a shorter shower, using organic products, all of those things that, that some of you are doing have a positive effect on reducing CO2 pollution, which is what causes climate change. The second thing that I worry about that is at the top of my list is income inequality. We now have a society in the United States where a handful of people have the vast majority of all the wealth in the country. We have three people in the United States who have wealth that is greater than the bottom 50% of our population. Three people have more wealth than 250 million people in the United States. Is that surprising? Does that seem like, do, do you think people should be allowed to accumulate as much wealth as they can? Or do you think there, there should be ways that mitigate that so that there's less people living in poverty and more people have a uh, chance at a, a better lifestyle and, and better life? Wait, I think, wait, you said 250 million and then you said 50% but there's not 500 million people in the United States. You're right, 200 million. So it's probably less? 200 million. Oh, all right. I, I'm like, glad someone's checking my math, thank you. Like, I'm fine, I'm, I think it makes sense for them to have that much wealth because, or else like, why would people, actually, it's, it, it's a little bit too much, I agree, but. Does anyone really yeah, have hundred billion dollars? They don't need it, but they earned it in a way with their ideas and like their will to hard work. Did they earn it or did all the people that work for them help them earn it? Well, they put the people in place. Like they were the, well, they employed them in a way. It was their idea. They employed them in, what I'm saying is I think that those employees should share in the wealth that was created and that all of the employees should have stock options so they can participate in the value that they're creating. I don't think the founder should not make a significant amount of money. To my mind, a hundred billion is just more than anybody needs. You know, I think 10 billion would probably be more than enough to do all the things that anyone could ever imagine doing. Uh, and we have some people like Bill Gates who have committed to give half their wealth away to charitable purposes, which I think is a wonderful thing. Um, but I do think that we have to restrain how much people make so that there's more available for lower income and middle income people. So 
I'm going to stop there. Does anyone have any questions for me? Anything you'd like to ask about business, about economics, about responsible business? Uh, feel free to either unmute yourself or you can um, ask it in the chat. And I actually just got a chat question asking, um, what is your opinion on ESOP? On what? ESOP. What is the SOP? Employee stock. Employee stock. I think employee stock. Oh, ESOP. Yeah. ESOP. Okay. Yes, ESOPs are wonderful, wonderful things. And they're companies where the employees own anywhere from 30 to 100% of the company. A good friend of mine has a business called Gardner Supply, which is an ESOP that's 100% owned by the employees. And for my opinion, I think every company should be an ESOP and every company should share some of the wealth they're creating with their employees. It would be one of the fastest and most effective ways that we could eliminate poverty in the United States. And other questions? Someone else asks, um, what was the biggest challenge of scaling seventh generation back in the 90s? Biggest challenge we faced was that people didn't understand why environmental products were important. So they didn't understand the importance of making tissue paper from recycled fiber instead of trees, virgin fiber. They didn't understand that the chemicals and cleaning products were toxic and could harm them and their children. So the biggest problem we faced was really an educational challenge. We had to educate people about dangerous chemicals. We had to educate people about safer products and why those products were good for them and their family. Great question. Other questions? What was the significance of switching to a public company and then back to a private company? Well, I was trying to raise money, and as a private company, I had run out of people to raise money from. So I went to the public market and raised money in the public market, which really allowed me to tap into thousands of people I didn't know. But as a private company, I was raising money from my friends, friends of my parents, friends of friends. And after several years, I just didn't know any more people that I could ask for money. So we sort of by default went public. And it was not a good thing to be such a small public company. And so as soon as we started to become successful, we bought all the stock back from the public. We paid a 40% premium over what the stock was trading for, bought all the stock back and became a private company once again until we sold the company in 2016 to Unilever. Another question I got in the chat is, do you think it is a good investment to create a responsible business? Certainly has been for me, certainly has been for companies like Stonyfield Yogurt that have done very well, Applegate Farms, Ben and Jerry's, so there have been a lot of responsible businesses that have been sold to large public companies. And in dozens and dozens of cases, those businesses have done extremely well, better than the average company. So I think that, and I, I teach a course at New York University on what's called social entrepreneurship. And social entrepreneurship is about how to run a socially responsible business. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest today among people in your age group to start those types of businesses because they do two things. One, they do very well financially. And two, they 
allow you to feel really good and proud about your contribution to society and the environment. Why, I'm looking now at the chat. I, I was able to fix my screen. So why did we sell the company? Um, you know, we sold the company because the company was about 30 years old and the people who had invested money wanted to get a return on their investment. And we decided the best way we could do that was rather than go public again, was to sell the company to Unilever, who was and has done an amazingly good job protecting our values and our vision and our environmental and social standards. A question I actually got privately um, relating to that is like, what are the pros and cons of like private companies versus public companies? Well, it's very expensive to have a public company because of the SEC reporting requirements, the insurance you have to have, your legal and accounting costs. So unless you're doing hundreds of millions of dollars, it doesn't make sense in many cases to be a public company today. You have much greater control over a private company usually than you do over a public company. Um, someone asked a great question. What is the one managerial skill that has helped you the most get to where you are today? So I would, I would say there are two things. One is being humble and not getting too carried away with your success, how much you think you know. I like to focus more on what I don't know rather than what I do know. And that's complemented by being curious and having the curiosity to ask great questions, find great mentors. So humbleness and curiosity are the two things that are at the top of my list. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to speak with us, Mr. Hollander. Your presentation was very interesting and eye-opening, and so were all your answers to the questions you've had. Um, and I know that everyone here has enjoyed it just as much as I did. To Great. all the Tell the Junior Economic Club of New York City members there is a newsletter coming your way, so look out for it for more information. And I know there are a couple of members here from the other JC branches, which is super exciting. So thank you so much for coming, and we hope to see you in the future for other events with us. And just again, Mr. Hollander, thank you so much for everything. Um, I sincerely enjoyed this hour a lot, uh, and I know that at least everyone on my board and everyone here has as well. My pleasure. And I hope this has been helpful and interesting. Uh, and please, please, please remember the importance of choosing the right products from the right companies. You can make a huge amount of difference. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, you too. Thank you all for coming.